Let's stand and sing and worship our Lord this morning.
right, good morning. Please be seated. All right, it is really good to see everybody this morning. So many kids are here. I'm excited because we're doing a children's message, and I'm going to need to hear you this morning, okay? So I'm going to ask you some questions, and you tell me what you think, okay? So the first one is, who do you think would win a battle, a Tyrannosaurus Rex or an Allosaurus? What do you think, Aiden? T-Rex. You think so too, Gavin? The T-Rex? All right. All right, here's the next one. Who's going to win a battle between Batman and Superman? I don't know. James just really sat on the edge of his seat. What do you think? Superman? Who thinks Superman? Batman? Oh, I got a little of both. Okay, here's another one. Who's going to win a battle between a lion and a kitty cat? Lion. The Cole family says a lion. All right, one more. Who would win a battle between a heavily armed warrior and a shepherd boy? Yep. So today's Bible story is going to answer that question, at least in the case of the shepherd boy, which you probably know is David and Goliath. And you probably know the story of David and Goliath, right? Goliath was a mighty warrior. He was over nine feet tall. Okay, he was really big, and he was protected from head to toe with an armor of bronze that weighed over a hundred pounds. And on top of that, he had a sword and a spear. Okay, and then there's David. He's a young shepherd boy. He has no armor for protection, and, and really the armor was too heavy for him to carry. But he didn't have a sword and a spear either. All he had was a sling and his ammunition was five stones that he picked up in the stream. And yet, David was able to defeat Goliath. That all of the Israelite army was afraid of. The whole army was afraid to face him. You know what? You and I may not face giants like Goliath. But we do have giants that we face in our lives. We face fear and loneliness, isolation, failure. They're some of the, the giants that we have to face. And how can we overcome those giants that want to defeat us so bad? Well, remember, there's five stones, right? So those five stones are going to help us know how, can we, how we can defeat the giants that we face. That first stone is courage. You see, David wasn't afraid to face the enemy. Actually, David tells Saul, don't worry about a thing. I will go fight this Philistine. You know, it also takes courage for us to fight the giants that we have in our lives. The second stone, that represents confidence. You see, as a shepherd boy, David often had to protect the sheep from wild animals. And this gave him the confidence that he needed to face the giant. He says, the Lord who saved me from the claws of the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. And like David, you and I can have confidence that will help us overcome the problems and the challenges that we face every day. Oh, the third stone represents preparation. You see, David didn't go to face Goliath unprepared. He went down to the stream, and he found five smooth stones, and he put them in his shepherd's bag. And then he picked up his staff, and he picked up, picked up his uh, sling, and he started out to fight Goliath. And it's really important for us to do everything possible that we can to be certain that we are prepared to face the challenges that we meet in our life. The fourth stone rep represents trust. You see, David didn't trust his own ability to beat Goliath. When Goliath shouted at David and he cursed at him and he was ready to kill him, here's what David said. You come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. When we face problems, which we all will, we have to put our trust in God, not in our own abilities. And finally, that fifth stone, it represents victory. It is God's battle, not ours. That's what David said. And that's why David was able to win the victory over the giant with only a stone and a sling. When you turn your battles over to, the, to God in your life, the battles of the giants, that's when you get victory. So the next time you face a giant in your life, remember David and Goliath 
and the five stones. So who would win, a heavily armored warrior or a shepherd boy? Well, the answer is a shepherd boy, but it is a shepherd boy that put all of his faith and all of his trust in God. And it gives us the opportunity to pray and ask God for faith like David's so that when the battles come our way that we're going to have to face those giants, we can do it with confidence and courage and preparation and trust and all those things. All right, kids, we're going to go downstairs and see what else God has for us this morning, okay? Let's go. Well, good morning. It is great to see all of you here this morning. Uh, There is quite a bit going on over the next couple of weeks that I want to uh, call to your attention, Uh, the first of which happens today at 12 noon. We will meet as a congregation to elect the nominating committee who will focus on the work of electing new elders, deacons, and trustees to begin in 2022. Wow, it's weird to say that already. Um, And so that is important work in the life of the church, and uh, we will come together as a community to to pray over them and to celebrate the work and the call that God has placed upon their life to serve the church in that way during this season. And so uh, look forward to that. Again, we'll meet at 12 noon, so immediately after the 11 o'clock service here in the sanctuary. Coming up this Tuesday, we have our next Women's Fellowship Night. They'll be meeting up here at the church at 7 p.m. to discuss a book on forgiveness. And uh, that is so important, uh, even in these days, it's critical Uh, for the life of the church and for us to be examples to the communities around us. Um, And so even if you haven't read the book, still come. It's a great chance to discuss forgiveness. And again, that's Tuesday, 7 p.m., right up here at the church. Uh, May 6th, we have our National Day of Prayer uh, kind of celebration. We'll be meeting at the Virginia Veterans Cemetery out in Amelia, a beautiful setting, uh, to come together in prayer and pray for our nation, and in particular, uh, pray for those who serve and protect our country in the armed forces. And uh, so we'll meet out at the cemetery at 930 for a time of prayer, and then we'll be heading back here to the church to uh, share a lunch under the pavilion, um, provided by Mission Barbecue. And so if you have not had a chance to sign up for that, you can do so by going to the uh, website and clicking on the events page and uh, just clicking the sign up link there. Uh, Tomorrow is the deadline to sign up. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, uh, please go ahead and do that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Coming up on May 16th, we get to celebrate spring with our spring picnic. And uh, so the deacons will be providing a meal for us, hot dogs, chips, waters, Uh, And so they are hard at work. Uh, The preparations, rather, are already underway. And again, that's May 16th. We'll be uh, sharing a picnic lunch together at uh, shortly after the 11 o'clock service ends at 12 noon. And so hope you can join us for that. Uh, A few weeks back, I told you about uh, an exciting development uh, for Swift Creek. We are going to be launching an app here shortly, and that will come with a redesigned website as well. And uh, so we are partnering with a company called Subsplash for that, and uh, development is already underway. Wendy and I got to take a first look at that this past week, and uh, it's just very exciting. It's going to allow us to uh, have some new capabilities, uh, one of which, and kind of my focus for it, is uh, the ability to stream without using Facebook Live or any other social media platform. Um, So you can stream the service directly on the app. Um, you can actually download the Swift Creek app on your television and uh, put it right next to Netflix or whatever it is you uh, enjoy watching. And uh, so you can stream us directly on your TV. And uh, so we look at that as, as a, an additional outreach uh, because it enables us not to just reach folks nearby, but also um, across the states and wherever they may be. So uh, really excited for that. Uh, there will be a number of other great features Uh, We'll roll those out. Uh, But as part of this, we're also going to be migrating our online giving from the current company that we use to Subsplash. And um, there are a couple of reasons for this. One, uh, it is a great way to involve um, uh, guests and and folks who are visiting the church to uh, include them in online giving as well. They can just do one-time gifts very easily. Um, 
it also is uh, really, it, it does provide us a cost savings on the development side of the app. And uh, so this is uh, an exciting time. Uh, more details will be coming out of, about that transition. It should be very easy and very straightforward. We'll have uh, information to put in your hands so that it guides you through the process very easily. If you need help with it, we can help with that. And um, we're going to do a beta test on the, uh, the staff and the elders uh, in the week to come. Uh, try to get them migrated over and, and just uh, be prepared to answer any questions that you guys have along the way. So uh, it's an exciting time for us, and I look forward to that uh, development up here at the church. With that, let us uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning. Uh, it's an exciting season in the world as, uh, as uh, we see blooms and signs of new life all around us. It is an exciting season in the life of the church as we celebrate uh, baptisms and confirmations this morning of, of the youth among us who are hearing uh, your call in their lives, who are uh, hearing your name proclaimed, and who are responding with their hearts and with their lips and, um, and with, their, with their voices. And so, Father, we uh, just give you thanks for this season. We give you thanks for all that you're doing up here at Swift Creek and for the generous uh, and faithful support that enables that and makes it uh, possible. Uh, God, you call us to be a people of movement, uh, to be a people called the way. And uh, so may we, Lord, this morning follow your word and follow our Lord as we continue our service of worship. And we pray this in the strong and saving name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'll be reading verses 25 through 50. Uh, as Wendy said, this is the account of David and Goliath. Uh, but before we uh, start the scripture reading, let me uh, give you a little bit of context for where we are this morning. So we are in our uh, third week of reopening Christianity, this uh, kind of conversation about what it looks like as the church uh, kind of re-energizes and revamps as uh, we come out of uh, the, the pandemic and, and all the events of this past year. And our, uh, our topic this week is offense or defense. And uh, that's the question before us. Are you on offense or defense? Uh, that's what the author of Reopening Christianity looks at this week. And he, he does so by looking at uh, football teams and, and different plays that can be called and things of that nature. So I look forward to hearing uh, feedback from all of you on, on how your small group discussions go on that topic, um, offense or defense. Uh, the context for our scripture reading this morning, in the beginning of 1 Samuel 17, you've got the Israelites and the Philistines kind of in two separate camps. And they set up uh, on, on two separate hills, and there is a valley, and we, we know what valley symbolizes, you know, struggle, strife, uh, sometimes um, even danger. Uh, so they're, they're set up on two hills. There's a valley that exists between them, and they are getting positioned for battle. And um, this guy comes out, Goliath, and uh, a couple of key details about Goliath. We are told his height. He is nine feet, nine inches tall. This is a giant guy. Um, Goliath is wearing 125 pounds worth of armor. He has come equipped. He's even got a, a shield bearer who will go out uh, before him. So he has come equipped and ready for battle. He's taunting the Israelites over and over again saying, um, let's, let's fight. Let's settle this in the valley and Let's do this. If I win, Goliath says, your people will serve me and our gods. And, and, if, and if you win, well, we'll serve you and your God. And uh, so that is kind of the challenge that exists. And uh, the Israelites, they're on the hill, but they are afraid. Every time Goliath comes out, they flee. They, they just head in the opposite direction. And, uh, and so then we are introduced to David. And um, David is tending uh, sheep. He's tending sheep in Bethlehem. And his father, Jesse, as, as this kind of potential conflict is underway over here, his father, Jesse, calls David and he says, listen, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to take 
um, some grain. I need you to take 10 loaves of bread and 10 pieces of cheese and head out um, to, to where the battle is to the Israelites and uh, provide that food, but also to hopefully bring back good news to Jesse. And uh, so that is what leads us up to our scripture reading this morning. Again, 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You come down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And King Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart. On account of this Philistine, your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield-bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was more, little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, "'Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks?' And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, which you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. 
As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. God's word to the church. Amen. So I'd like to look at kind of three different stories this morning and uh, ask or kind of make three primary observations about uh, this text, this story of victory uh, as we look at David facing Goliath. Uh, the first of which is, uh, is about a wedding. Um, I was uh, just honored yesterday to uh, just be in the congregation and celebrate uh, the marriage of my baby sister and uh, her new husband, James. They got married up in Northern Virginia, and um, it was a great time for our family and a few friends to come together. I think we had 21 in all at the service um, and uh, got married in the courtyard at the, at the church up in uh, Northern Virginia where I was, uh, went to high school. And so it was an exciting season for our family. Um, uh, you've probably heard me talk about Margaret every now and then. Um, she has had her fair share of challenges um, growing up, uh, none of her own making. Uh, and, um, and so it was just really, as her big brother, it was just uh, awesome to see her uh, walk into that courtyard in a wedding dress uh, to, to come and to uh, celebrate God's anointing of the marriage between her and James. And uh, it was it was just really cool to see, and I know those of you who have uh, been there for your own weddings or um, weddings of family members, it's, it's an exciting time, and uh, it's, it's uh, as the pastor said yesterday, and this, this line really stood out to me, you know, the marriage is, is, or the wedding rather, is not the finish line, it's actually the starting line for the marriage that follows, and, um, and so got the chance to celebrate um, this union that kind of came out of some difficult uh, circumstances for Margaret uh, growing up. We see the Israelites this morning. Uh, they are in the valley, uh, but they keep fleeing Goliath. And uh, so this young boy, David, comes onto the scene. And he goes into the valley right on to the battlefield. Uh, we think of... Uh, Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This is not an exciting place to be necessarily. It's not necessarily a hopeful place to be. But David feels called by the Lord to go out into the valley. Isn't it true this morning that oftentimes we feel God's presence most? We experience and see his victory the most when we're in the valley. That's where David was, and that's where David experienced victory. Now, I watched a movie uh, last weekend and then watched it again this uh, past week. It's called Seven Yards. Has anyone seen that? All right, so you all have a homework assignment. Seven Yards. It's an excellent movie. It is a, a documentary that follows a young boy uh, named Chris, not David, Chris uh, Norton. He, was, uh, he had graduated high school, was in his freshman year of college, and uh, a strong, strong family of believers. And so uh, Chris is on the uh, football team for Luther College. And uh, as a freshman, it's pretty rare that you, as a true freshman, get called to start on the team, whether it's on offense or defense, uh, it's pretty rare that you get to, to play your first year as a starter. And so Chris Norton was kind of uh, being watched very closely because of uh, his strengths on the football field. In fact, he was included in special teams. Uh, we think about offense or defense. Uh, special teams is sometimes where the biggest plays uh, can happen. Uh, 
And so Chris was on special teams. And um, as they're getting ready to kick off to the opposing team, Central College, uh, it was a division rival, someone that it was one of those games that everyone just gets really amped up for. Um, Chris is called uh, to be on special teams, and they say they're going to kick the ball to the right side of the field, which is where Chris is. So he's going to run and try to, to tackle the, the return man. And so the ball is kicked. Chris takes off running. And he says in the documentary that he leapt, but he leapt just a little bit before he should have. And so with his head back a little bit and the, the angle of the hit, he fractured vertebrae and uh, fell to the ground. And he says it felt like someone had turned off the power in his body. He was laying there with his head facing one side, looking at grass, and he was unable to move anything, paralyzed. Chris was laying on the field, and he started to panic. Shortly, the trainers get there. Shortly, the EMS arrive to stabilize his neck, not realizing even at that point the full extent of his injuries. Chris was carted off the field. At the end of the game, the players were kneeling down to talk about this struggle, this trial that they were facing as a community. And as they were kneeling, the helicopter took off, taking Chris to the hospital. He began to panic more and more and more. He got to the hospital room and he said it was white, it was sterile. All the doctors and nurses were already there, ready to receive him. And they put him into an MRI machine. If you've been in an MRI machine, you know how claustrophobic it is. Imagine being in that tiny space and now you can't even move a muscle. The panic began to grow and grow in Chris's being, his soul. And he prayed to God and he fell asleep. When the MRI was over, Chris came out. And when he woke up, he knew that was a sign that God was with him. Sometimes it's in the valleys of life where we sense God's presence the most and where we see his victory. Sometimes when you move in the direction that God is calling you, people will speak doubt into your life. When you're doing the work God's called you to do, when you're testifying to the truth that God has placed within you, people will speak words of doubt in your life. Think of young David. He's feeling God's call to go and defeat the Philistines, to defeat Goliath, an improbable task. And instead of the people around him encouraging him, they speak doubt into his life. Jesse, David's own father, had, had sent David's older brothers into battle, but he'd kept David, the younger one, aside to tend the sheep. When Jesse ultimately sends David, it's not to go into battle as a warrior. It's not because he believes victory will come through David's life and his work. It's because he wants him to deliver food to the army. People around you will speak doubt into your life. Eliab, David's older brother, he himself, he gets jealous of David even though he's in the group that continues to run away from Goliath, run away from the battle, 
he gets jealous of David and gets mad at him and he calls him wicked. And he, he says, listen, you just showed up to, to rubberneck. You just showed up to watch this all go down. You didn't come here to contribute. God's not going to do anything through you. What does Saul say this morning? What does Saul say to David? He says, you're too young. You're too young for God to do anything through you. Never listen to those words. You are never too young for God to work in you, work through you, and to bring change to the people around you in your lives. When you're in the valley, sensing that's where God's called you to go, people will speak doubt into your life. As Chris was in the hospital room and beginning to heal from surgery that involved getting rods and steel placed in his spine so that the bone graft material could heal. He was still sitting there paralyzed. The doctors told him he only had a 3% chance of moving anything below his neck again. Those are the odds when you look at the kind of injury Chris experienced. Only 3%. One morning, Chris felt something in his left big toe. He felt something, and the doctor was in the room. He called the doctor into the room, and he said, listen, I'm, I'm experiencing something. Something feels just a little bit different. He said, would you, would you take off my shoe and look at my toe? Chris had been hard at work. He was doing therapy. He was doing physical rehabilitation, just trying to get any movement. He said it wasn't his muscles that got tired. It was his nerves. But this morning, something felt different, and he asked the doctor, look at my foot. The doctor told him, you're just experiencing phantom feelings. It's just a figment of your imagination. Listen, young man, you will never walk again. The doctor refused to even look at his foot. People will speak doubt to you while you're in the valley doing the work God's called you to do. Chris's doctor kept telling him, you'll never move again. His mother was reflecting on all that had happened. She felt helpless when he flew off in that helicopter because he was all by himself. She felt helpless as she looked down and saw her son in the bed, realizing that life had changed forever. He was maybe not going to walk ever again. The sports were done. Chris was a freshman in college. Would he finish? She had hoped he would meet a girl one day and date and get married. She didn't even know if that would happen. Except Chris met a girl online. Her name is Emily. And Emily, they chatted back and forth. And eventually, Chris got released from the hospital. And uh, I, I can't commend this movie to you enough. It is such an example of the church being the church. His friends surrounded him. He went back to college. His buddies, the people God placed in his life, they took care of him. They, they put on his shoes. They helped him get dressed. They helped him get to where he was going. 
There was a joke in the dorm, who has slept with Chris the most? Because his buddies would be in bed right next to him because when he was trying to sleep, there were times he would get an itch or a weird sensation and it helped have somebody right there with you. It was the church being the church. And so one day after Emily and Chris had been chatting back and forth, they decided to meet up at a hot dog stand uh, for their first date. And uh, it was the beginning of a wonderful relationship, uh, one in which Emily began to help take care of Chris as well. Second lesson for today, trust in the work that God's had you do beforehand because it's equipped you for growing the kingdom. Trust in the work God's had you do beforehand because it will equip you for growing the kingdom. David has been tending sheep. He's the youngest. When he feels called to go into battle, to face the nine foot nine giant with 125 pounds of armor and with a shield bearer who goes in front of him, David trusts in the work God had him doing leading up to that point. He's faced lions. There was a strong consensus for lions, I believe, from the Cole family, right? He's fought lions. He's fought bears. David is confident that the work God's been doing in his life up to that point will carry him through the battle ahead, even while he's in the valley. I was given a role in the wedding yesterday. My sister asked if I would be willing to use my phone to play the recorded music that was going to be played for her marriage. And so I happily agreed to that and volunteered. I have a Bose uh, SoundLink speaker. If you, any of you know what those are like? They're about this big, uh, Bluetooth connection, and it really is a very powerful speaker. It puts out a lot of volume for this uh, little tiny thing. And uh, so I volunteered, I would bring that. It's a little black uh, speaker. And, uh, and so then Friday, as we were getting ready to head up north, things, kind of plans changed for a couple of different reasons. And I was going to drive separately from Nicole. And there was a chance I would be kind of careening into the rehearsal on two wheels, um, just from a timing standpoint. And so I, I gave Nicole the speaker and I said, listen, I, I have given you the music files. If I'm not there for the rehearsal, just you know, use the speaker and, and play the songs. And she agreed. And so um, I said, okay, so there's two things. You need to take my clothes and you need to take the speaker because the speaker is what I agreed to do. And so um, we got up there for the rehearsal and uh, it was a little chaotic. And, uh, but it was, we were standing there. I turned to Nicole and I said, do you have the speaker? And she said, ah, it's in the car. So she turned and she starts to walk to the car. And then she turns back very quickly. And she said, I left it in the hotel. Okay, we can roll with this, no problem. And, uh, and so... Come wedding day, we wake up, we have breakfast, we're downstairs in the lobby, we go back up to the room, and I said, honey, can you give me the speaker? And she just, it was one of those toothy grins, like, what's going on here? And she said, I can't find it. I think I left it at home. Okay. Okay. It was only 9.30. We had time to recover. And uh, so all was well. Uh, Ethan and I took off for um, Target and got one of these. My sister's name is Margaret Teal Frost. And so it was kind of cool. I was like, man, I see God's hand in this. Like, this is great. Her wedding flowers 
teals and purples. And I, I was just, I was like, this is cool. So instead of going to the closer target, we went to the one that was a little further away at, just to get the teal version of that Bose SoundLink speaker. Um, we got back to the hotel in time to, to let it fully charge and just really felt good about uh, just that God was providing in this moment, right? Um, that he was working through us, equipping us for the day. Chris set a goal for himself. Paralyzed from the neck down, he set a goal for himself that he was going to walk. He'd return to school. He finished his studies a semester early. And his goal was to walk across the stage at graduation. So he and Emily worked and worked and worked. They came across the story of a personal trainer who had done this before with another man who had been paralyzed. And they engaged his services. And he was in therapy for four to five hours a day with the trainers, and then he would go home and do two more hours on his own, trusting, believing, having faith. Day before graduation, Chris proposed to Emily. She's like, because you didn't have enough going on in life. You weren't stressed out about enough, this whole walking across the stage. He proposes to Emily, and she says, yes. And then he did it. Chris was wheeled up onto the stage to one end, and he stood on his own and walked across the stage. Trust in the work God's had you do ahead of time. Because through it, you are being equipped to grow the kingdom. And lastly, there will be echoes in the valley. There will be echoes of God's victory, even while you're fighting in the valley. Think about it. You're standing in the valley between two mountains, and you shout. What does David shout? You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. There's an echo heard by both the victors and those who have been conquered. There was a 12th man on the field Chris wasn't done yet. As I'm watching this movie, I kept thinking to myself over and over again, seven yards, why seven yards? And as, as the movie's getting closer to the end, you think, okay, Chris is graduating, he can walk again. He's gonna walk the seven final yards on the football field. He's gonna do something with, with a football to kind of bring this all back together. He walked seven yards because that was the length it would take to walk next to his bride down the aisle. Seven yards, side by side. In Ephesians chapter five, Paul says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Wood and sticks and stones. David was given a stick and a stone, and through those was victorious. 
as we celebrate baptism and communion this morning, Jesus hung on a piece of wood. He was stuffed into a tomb that was closed with a stone. He conquered the cross. He conquered the grave for you. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for your movement in our lives. Uh, Lord, when we look out, sometimes it's easy to focus on, on the valley, to see that and to just dwell in that space. Uh, but Father, we are so thankful that uh, you are behind us, you are before us, and you are beside us. And so Father, may we trust in you and your deliverance. May we um, join David in uh, proclaiming that we come against the evils of the world in the name of of the Lord Almighty, and we pray this in his name, amen. At this time, I'll invite the Collins family to come forward, as well as Sarah. You guys want to stand over on this side? Well, I've had the privilege of getting to know Rick and Carla and Sarah over the past uh, few weeks uh, and months as uh, they've been attending here at Swift Creek. Um, next week, you'll see Rick and Carla back up here um, as they join. We, they attended the Inquirers, uh, the most recent Inquirers class and got a chance to know them. And Sarah attended as well. And she was, got the uh, confirmation wrap up also. So she's had a good, solid dose of Presbyterian theology. Yay! Um, but uh, what a joy it is to be with you this morning on this day of your baptism. And let me read again uh, the words that Paul wrote in the Ephesians, or to the Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water. And that's why we're here this morning. Sarah, um, you are here, you've elected to be baptized, and this is a wonderful day in your life, your family's life, and in our life together as the church. Uh, James, who presents uh, Sarah for baptism? On behalf of the session, I present Sarah Collins, daughter of Rick and Carla Collins, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Congregation, I have two questions for you. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Sarah, by word and deed, with love and prayer, do you? Will you encourage her to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? Will you? James, can I hand this to you? Sarah? Sarah, this is for you. Water drips, you can use that, okay? Let us pray. Father God, as a prelude to your acts of creation, uh, your spirit hovered over the waters, uh, bringing order out of chaos. Uh, Father, over time, uh, we have seen your power manifest through waters, delivering the uh, Israelites from slavery in Egypt as they passed through the Red Sea. We saw Jesus baptized himself, or Jesus baptized by John in the Jordan River, uh, we saw Jesus walk on water, showing his power over chaos and storms that come up in our lives. Uh, Lord, likewise, we pray this morning that your spirit would be present in these waters as they um, cleanse Sarah of sin and are a sign of the new and abundant work that you are beginning in her life. We pray that uh, these waters would flow down and that she would feel the, the, uh, the significance of being baptized into a death like Jesus so that she too can experience the freedom of being raised to, do, to new life like Christ as well. Amen. Sarah, trusting in the mercies of God, is it your desire that you be baptized this morning? Excellent. Come a little closer. Sarah Rose Collins daughter of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Marking you with the sign of the cross, Sarah, the Holy Spirit is with you 
guiding you. Jesus is within your heart, and it's the beginning of a wonderful relationship. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for the waters of baptism, for the movement that you have begun in Sarah's life, uh, leading her um, into a new and abundant journey with you. Uh, We thank you for Jesus' call in all of our lives and and give you thanks uh, that Sarah has responded in this way this morning. Uh, Father, surround her with brothers and sisters uh, of all ages on this walk, uh, being with her, uh, teaching her, guiding her as she uh, follows you. Uh, But Lord, as a member of the church, let us also have ears that can hear and receive uh, Sarah's own experiences Uh, with Jesus as uh, she goes on this journey of faith. We thank you for Rick and for Carla for raising uh, such a beautiful daughter in spirit, and we pray that, uh, God, they will continue to uh, walk with her on this journey of faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations. All right, if you two would like to be seated, I'll invite Marina and Susan and the rest of the confirmands to come forward. Thank you, James. At our session meeting on Tuesday night, um, we had the privilege of hearing the testimony of each of these five young women and uh, It was just awesome to hear about God's work in their lives. And so I'd like to introduce to you this morning our newest members of the church, uh, beginning with Sarah Collins and Maya Burgess, Renzi Ballou, Ava Booth, and Mia Winters. Um, Marina and Susan uh, went through confirmation with them, uh, learning about a range of different things, exploring their own faith journeys, and it was a joy to hear about those on uh, Tuesday night. So thanks for sharing all of that with you. You do not have to share those all over again this morning. Um, But I do have a few questions for you as we celebrate uh, you confirming uh, the promises that others made on your behalf to follow Jesus. Uh, You are confirming those for yourselves this morning. And um, so um, uh, please uh, answer. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn away from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world. Do you? Good answer. Who is your Lord and Savior? Is it Jesus Christ? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? And finally, will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship by the breaking of bread and the prayers? Will you? Excellent. Let us pray. Father God, as we look at our scripture this morning, we are reminded that you often work through the young people in our lives. And so what a joy it is for us to receive them into full membership in the church. And uh, as we celebrate with them and their families, we celebrate the work that you have already done in their lives. Uh, But God, we are also looking forward to what you will accomplish through them Uh, God, as we think of the Great Commission to go and to baptize and to tell all the nations about your work and your will, God, I pray that you will be within each one of these ladies and uh, that uh, through their acts of service, through their testimony, and uh, through just their very beings, people will experience uh, the presence of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Congratulations. You can be seated. Thank you.
trust in the work God's already been doing in your life through it he is equipping you to serve the kingdom I went out and bought that teal speaker Nicole and the kids stayed in Northern Virginia last night and I got home about 11 o'clock and I got a text it said if I don't laugh I will cry it was in my purse And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be all glory, honor, power, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen.